G'day legends and welcome to this week's episode of the Scale HQ podcast. My guest today, Ben Marcinet, is running Australia's largest traffic control company. And before you go, why do I want to listen to anything about traffic control? This story, of course, is not about traffic control, really, but it's actually a, you know, it's a $300 million plus company. And 10 years ago, it was at $70 million. And the CEO has grown up through the ranks. He started, you know, on the road doing traffic control when he was in his uh, late teens, early 20s, and has grown through the organization. And he's only ever done traffic control and he became the CEO. So I think there's some really interesting stuff that I've unpacked with Ben today about his own personal journey. And 12 months ago, they took on a major, you know, a majority investment from a large uh, private equity firm well known in Australia. So significant capital injection. And in the last, you know, 12 months, they've done four acquisitions. So we're going to unpack a bit about what it's like having a private equity partner, how all that happened, what's it like, you know, doing all of these acquisitions, what's their, you know, their growth strategy that's got them to here and what's the growth strategy that's going to get them to there. So really interesting organization and also a very human story about the way they built culture, the way they built trust in that organization and how important that culture has been to the way they've actually scaled that business. So I think you'll absolutely love today's uh, episode. Enjoy this conversation with Ben Marcinet. Welcome to the Scale HQ podcast, your weekly injection of tips and insights into the secrets of scaling. I'm your host, Sean Steele, and I am obsessed with figuring out how to help founders just like you who are creating real value in the world to scale up so they can fulfill their potential. I do that each week by interviewing founders who successfully scaled, experts in all the areas of business that you need to master, interviews with founders who are still on the way up, and 10-minute tutorials and reflections from me based on my experiences in creating 100 million bucks in revenue for four other companies over eight years. So let's dive in and see what gems we can find together on this week's episode of the Scale HQ Podcast. Good everybody and welcome back to the Scale HQ podcast. Welcome back to our regular listeners. We love having you here every week and welcome to anybody joining us for the first time. Thrilled to have you and I'm sure you all enjoy today's show. My guest this week is Ben Marcinet, Group CEO of Altus Traffic Australia, the 22-year-old um, largest provider of traffic management services in the country, over two and a half million hours of services annually to over 1,300 organizations. And uh, Ben, you and your team have been super busy. Uh, you know, I'd been looking at your LinkedIn over the last few weeks and had seen that you guys had acquired Shield Traffic only a month ago, and then you acquired Traffic Management New Zealand uh, only days ago, I believe. Days, is it? Yeah, da- yeah. yesterday, I think it was. So, yeah, we've had, we've had a little <laughs> bit going on in the last uh, last couple of months. So, yeah, we uh, it's just the way we like it. We're having a bit of fun. Well, one of the things that I love about that is that you've uh, obviously got a sufficiently quality uh, team that you're able to still get on a podcast with me the day after you've just done an acquisition in New Zealand. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much and credit to your uh, to credit to your team. And thanks to uh, Isha Oberoi, who um two-time guest on Scale HQ podcast, who connected uh, you and I. Um, ben, your background really interested me because most of the CEOs on the show are founders, um, but you grew up through the ranks to become um, CEO, which I certainly resonate with as I did the same thing in my own path. And so I'm really keen to unpack a little bit of that. But you have gone through a lot of changes in your business, particularly in the last 12 months, uh, having taken a major stake, uh, majority stake, I believe, from private equity, uh, sorry, private equity, Pacific Equity Partners or PEP, um, Mm -hmm. mid-22. And you've done four acquisitions since then and looks like you've divested your engineering uh, business modus. Uh, So clearly a lot going on. And I'd love to understand a bit more of you know, your role on the challenge, the challenge is also in running a large geographically diverse blue collar workforce, um, sure. as well as some of the journey of taking on a bit of private equity uh, investment. How does that sound as a bit set up for us today? Mate, I've got a long list of stories I can tell you covering that <laughs> those subjects, I can tell you. So Fabulous. Sounds great. Well, look, um, I don't know if you share numbers publicly at the moment, but can you just give us a sense of the size of the organization just to start with so we can kind of get our heads around what, you know, what does Alstus look like? Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, it is the largest uh, traffic management business across Australia and New Zealand now. Um, so our revenues are north of $350 million, um, and we've got a workforce of about 4,500 staff now, which um, still feels a bit crazy to me to say, given where we were um, probably 18 months ago. But uh, yeah, so we we cover about 48 branches, I think we've got now. So I kind of yeah. lose track of how many we've got. But yeah, lots mm. of operating locations, um, big geographic diversity, and uh, so what, probably one of the best collections of human beings you'll find anywhere in any business. So um, yeah, yeah we're um, yeah, we're loving it. Well, I expect it probably looked pretty different 10 years ago when you were an operations manager in New South Wales. What was the size of the company then? What did it sort of look like compared to today? 
I think when I joined Altus, it was turning over about 70 million. But wow. yeah, I mean, we could go a fair bit further back if you like, Sean, and we can go right back to the day when I started standing on the side of the road holding a, a, a stop slow back. So that's where it actually all began. Oh, I didn't realize you actually started on the road. Do tell. I did, yeah. So when I was like 18, um, I uh, you know, kind of just out of school, don't really know what you want to do with your life and you're kind of bumming around from job to job. Uh, I lost my driver's license, which meant that my illustrious career as a pizza delivery driver came to a pretty abrupt halt. Uh, <laughs> I had one of those days. Great job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the old man was quite insistent that I get a job. Um, so I walked into a traffic control depot and kind of started that day and I think, um, you know, pretty early on, I think I was, I was probably 18 or something and I was making about $1,000 a week in the hand as a traffic controller mm-hmm. and I honestly thought I was Kerry Packer, right? Like uh, <laughs> all my mates were, you know, sort of at uni and doing sort of odd jobs. So, yeah, kind of yeah. got into it and then yeah, just sort of moved my way through it over the journey and um, I think one of the most formative roles I had was when I was about 21 uh, I worked as a, I, I got put into the office and I was working as a scheduler in a sort of dispatch. So mm-hmm. um, di- taking all the orders from the customers so you learned how to speak to a customer. But most importantly, you had to allocate all the shifts to all of the, the traffic workers. And this is before, you know, sort of uh, text messages and push notifications. So I had to ring them all one by one. So, you know, for a couple of years I did that and, um yeah, got to uh, got to learn how to, to speak with and deal with, you know, sort of those guys and influence people to, to get the right outcome. And um, that was pretty formative. And then, yeah, I've just been very fortunate. I'm happy to tell you the story of kind of the rise up through Altus, if you like. Well, let me let me ask you, because I know we've got a slightly shorter, because um, we had a few technical issues uh, in our sort of version one. So this is version two. We've got less time. Um, when did you know that you wanted to be CEO or did you know um like when was there was there a point where you were like I know that's actually a gig that I really want to work towards or were you just sort of taking the next thing that you could see in front of you just taking the next thing I I Mm -hmm. probably somewhere in the back of my mind thought one day maybe I might do it but you know even in I was probably thinking 10 years from where I am today certainly when I got the tap on the shoulder from the founder David um, I, I was uh, was a bit shocked and probably wasn't quite ready for it. But I've never mm. I've never applied for a job in my life. I've never asked for a promotion. I've never asked for a pay rise. So just kind of mm. along the way, people yeah see potential always, and give you a crack. You know, I always love the fact that you know if you once you kind of know about seventy or eighty percent of what you're going to learn in that job, that's the perfect time to be getting to the next one, right? Because you know you sort of that that the learning curve starts to slow down a little bit if you don't go back into the deep end and learn the and you know that's. People have asked. I remember people asking me, you know, when did you, when did you know you were ready to be a CEO? And I probably like you. I was like, I, I don't think I really knew that. It just all of a sudden became a thing, and it was there. And I thought, geez, I don't even know if I'm going to be any good at that, but I'll give it a crack. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you learn fast, don't you? <laughs> yeah, no, you, yeah, absolutely learn fast. You don't have a lot of time to, uh, to get your feet under the desk. Well, Ben, speaking of that, how did you? What did you do in terms of um, support around you? Because when you step into the CEO's shoes, I mean, that is a very different job to any executive level job prior to being the CEO. There's a lot of new things that come with it, lots of new stakeholders, significant amounts of pressure, et cetera, et cetera. How did you resource your support and the wisdom and the advice around you to ensure that you could actually succeed in the role? Yeah, I, I, look, I went... Um, firstly, I had I, I totally underestimated what being a CEO was, like hugely underestimated it. And you know, in the first couple of months, it started to sort of dawn on me. So, um, a few really good guys inside of the business sort of elevated up a level. We we kind of did some structural changes to get some better people, you know, high level people around me internally. But a lot of it, I went to, to kind of external counsel. So I got a link, got linked up with a couple of guys that had had been on a journey and went to sort of hunt down a few different perspectives that guys I still work with now um, that are, that have been really formative for me is, um, is kind of moving into the role um, that yeah. I totally underestimated. <laughs> well, yeah, I love that. I love that. And, you know, and it's pivotal to get the right um, the right people around you to keep you honest as you're going through and to also be able to bounce things off and, and, and to, you know, paint the picture of the box that you can't see because you're inside it and uh, everybody else yeah. is outside it. So yeah. <laughs> and I think David, outside. David, the founder of the business has been really good through that too. I mean, I'm kind of the third CEO that he's had working for him and he's got a, okay. he's got an incredible perspective on the organization. So he, he's always been a very good sounding board, someone who um, definitely keeps me in line when others won't. So 
um, yeah, I've got a very close relationship with him. He's been fantastic too. You need that. Well, could you give me, I mean, from where it was 10 years ago at 70 and now you're you know, north of 300, can you give me just a sense of some of the high level sort of milestones, the things that were maybe inflection points or key strategies that really started to change the nature of the business and accelerate your growth? Yeah, I think, look, we, we got stuck in a number of ceilings along the way. One of them was around sort of 70 million. I've sort of learned over the sort of organic growth journey that businesses do hit these ceilings, right? And I think, um, and you get the kind of 70 or 150 was another really hard one for us as well, where you just sort of learn that you, you need to really shift the way that you run your business. I mean, the opportunities that were coming in and the customer relationships and stuff that we have uh, have always been really, really strong. But just in terms of the way we actually run and operate our business from a systems point of view, and I think we made some big investments in that. We, we built our own software. I can write a book on why that's not the greatest idea in the world. Um, <laughs> But the output of that and that solution was just huge for us. It, it really allowed us to scale and really punch through that, that 140, 150 mark was probably a really key one where you just moved from you could no longer run your business sort of line of sight anymore. You needed a lot more systems and insights sort of around you. That was a, a really sort of key milestone for us because we kind of already had the geographic footprint and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. that, that was that was pretty big. It fundamentally shifted the way we, we ran our back end, which which liberated a lot of labor and talent to be able to focus on um, getting more Did people the team, out the road. You know, sometimes, uh, certainly it's been my experience and watching a lot of other founders go through some of those, to your point, like kind of big inflection points or the ceilings, quite often there's a team change at those points uh, as well because not everybody who got you to where you are today are the people that get you to the next stage that may not have been there or may not be able to sort of carve that path. Yeah. Were there sort of major team shifts that happened at the same time as those systems? Yeah, yeah. I think um, and and generally it was, you know, even right at the top, I think, it, you know, we, we shared – yeah, I think Steve O'Dwyer, our CEO, finished, you know, probably around that 100 million mark. I think Jeff Doyle, my predecessor, was around that 150 mark. And mm-hmm. along the way, you know, there'd always been changes in the executive ranks as the business matured. But, um, yeah. yeah, kind of different ways of thinking about it, I suppose, came in. Um, but uh, it, it, the year I took over, it would be just done 140. So that was about two and a half okay. years ago. So Yeah, wow. And so what have you learned about, um, personally, about leadership in that, doubling of the business uh in those in those several years like what have or maybe what have you had to unlearn about how you thought things needed to happen and what have you had to sort of you know instill as new principles or beliefs or strategies in your own leadership given the change i mean that's a significant change in the employee base and the complexity and a whole bunch of things what have you learned yeah i think the the biggest thing is around this idea of communication. I think the biggest thing for moving from kind of being a manager to being a leader is, is really starting to understand the way you need to interact with your workforce and the messages you give them and all the rest of it. And I think there's a there's a great quote out there somewhere that says, you know, people communication is sort of never finished, right? When Just when you think you're finished, you've got to go around and start again. So I'm sort of endlessly trying to refresh the message and the way in which we interact with the workforce. That's been sort of the biggest learning and evolution, I think, for me in the last two years is just, yeah, kind of getting that kind of strategy to a way that you can communicate it to the traffic controller that you're having a sandwich with in your donger in Townsville, but then also... Yeah as you're swanning around the ivory tower of, of PEP, it, it kind of can make a bit of sense as well, you know. So, But definitely yeah. just this idea of the con- how consistent and constant your message needs to be. Um, and I'm kind of always learning and trying to evolve that, that way of thinking, you know. And you think that you've, you know, you're like, surely I've said this enough times and everybody's got it by now. But, as you know, sometimes yeah. you hear the same thing in 14 different styles and, uh with different layers different metaphors yeah so when you're sick of saying it they're just starting to hear it right just starting to get it that's it yeah, yeah. um i would love to unpack some of the implications of you know there's a lot of founders listening so the you know the majority of the founders in this um in this podcast you listen to it are seven figure founders they're one to ten mil they're doing well the businesses are growing well they're already in the top 10 percent of entrepreneurs they're not 350 million but they've grown a great business but they haven't been to eight figures they don't know what's coming lots of them uh, imagine that perhaps somewhere between you know ten and thirty, they might take on an investor because they're going to kind of run out of all. You know, they're going to slow their growth rate if they don't take on an, any um, any capital. So lots of them think about you know maybe they'll start looking at private equity if they've got two or three million in EBITDA and you know private equity starting to get interested. Can you talk to me about the 
the timing of the private equity investment? What motivated it? How did you how did you end up with PEP? Did you sort of go to market? Or was it was just existing relationships. Like, talk to me a bit about the the culmination of them as a provider and at the time what was going on there. Yeah, I think a lot a lot of it was sort of David, the the founder of Altus, who's kind of run and grown this thing. You know, sort of funded it himself for the whole sort of journey. Um, was just at a point where the business was getting kind of too big and too complicated for him just to sort of be the, the single founder. So, um, yeah, we, this was actually our third attempt at getting private equity in. We'd had uh, okay. two guys around before. Um, and and by those two unsuccessful ones was more to do. We just couldn't find the, the right partner to sort of back the business. We were very sort of um, disciplined around who the, the equity partner needed to be. Um, so, yeah, we're just at a point where it needed more capital. There was just, you know, the orga- we talk a lot about the M&A and, and that sort of growth that we've had, but the biggest chunk of what we've had has been organic. I mean, we've added $100 million of revenue in, in 18 months right, <laughs> through wow. organic growth. Jeez. And every time you do that, it's more trucks. It's more, it's just capital coming out everywhere. And I think David was just at a point where, we, with all of that going on, plus this new technology we're bringing to the industry, it was just very difficult for him to sort of fund it where he was at. So, um, yeah, we, we ran a process. We had an advisor, Nova Capital, working for us, and we went and ran a process. And this time around, the third time around, we had a very clear strategy around what we wanted to achieve, whereas I think the first two times we maybe didn't. Um, we had a strategy around, you know, continued organic growth, you know, deploying a sort of market-leading digital solution that will fundamentally reshape the way this industry operates and change the safety of road workers in this country, and then also some targeted M&A. So once we had all of that very clear around where we were going, we took it to the market and literally were, were inundated, right? We had, we had a multiple offers coming in very, very quickly. We were doing, you know, a whole bunch of management presentations. But PEP just absolutely stood out like from from all of the others right they got it they understood there was almost like a very quick alignment between us and the firm i remember sitting on the the first management presentation we're taking them through these kind of three pillars and matt robinson the md from pep just said ben look mate we get it we we understand exactly what you're doing and we are huge believers in it and we reckon we can do something special here. And um, it kind of evolved very, very quickly from there. They were absolute standout head and shoulders above in terms of alignment. And that was probably the most important thing we were looking for in, in the deal. So um, I love, and I probably didn't and- say as nice things about them for the next five months while they went through me like a dose of salt <laughs> through diligence, but um, we're, we're in a good spot now. Did, um, and I, I'm thrilled to hear you say that because a lot of um, founders think they, they just need some investment, but there's a big difference between just receiving capital and capital come from lots of different kinds of sources and the capability that you actually might be looking to add or to give you strength so that you can execute whatever that plan is. Was there a specific capability that you're really looking for from PEP over and above the capital that they were able to bring that perhaps others weren't? Uh, look, I think what, what impressed us about those guys was just the breadth of experience. I mean, they're kind of industry agnostic, so they've been in all sorts of stuff, sheep farming mm. and food and pharmaceuticals and now traffic management, which they're very excited about, I can tell you. Um, but kind of that breadth of experience was, was, was really important to us. And I think the operating style was also very important. You know, you get funds that will put in operating partners and, you know, be very involved mm-hmm. in your business. Now, you know, you approach it all with a fair degree of skepticism system to be honest when you everyone's courting each other but you know I, I think the real secret source for PEP as a fund is not necessarily they buy the best assets it's actually the way they operate them um, they do genuinely support a management team once they know they've got the right management team they will back you like all, all the way you know and that came across a lot early days but I couldn't stress to you enough how important I think alignment with your investor is that you know don't just mm-hmm. run and take the the biggest check which we didn't do right we we went to yeah. the best align um fund yeah. for what it is that we were looking to do couldn't agree more i mean that that alignment piece is so critical you imagine being in a situation where you just take on a new you know you take it on an investor and all of a sudden all the hairs on the fact that you the things that you didn't actually bother to really figure out in terms of alignment start to you know roost you know rear their heads and all of a sudden you just have the worst 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 experience you can imagine because 
you got someone who's got a real say <laughs> and a real, yeah. uh, real shareholder, and they got a yeah. lot of uh, a lot of views. And you got yeah, you you end up spending all of your time in arguments rather than actually just being able to get on and execute. Yeah, and I think the How private you... equity the private equity industry doesn't have the best reputation. Let's be fair, right? And I think a lot of that comes back to to the original alignment between the the founder or the management mm. team or whatever. I think if you get that right, yeah, you can do something pretty special. And is was there a um, is there anything you can share about the way you aligned key management, um, you know, sort of beyond yourself and your leadership, you know, your leadership team, perhaps, for example, with the private equity owners to make sure that everybody's sort of gunning for the same goals? Yeah, look, I think you know, I think what what people, where well, I think people often get it wrong is they kind of get reward and recognition, and they use it in the same sentence. I think you know, we kind of split that apart. There's a lot of recognition stuff that we do with our workforce that brings a lot of alignment, but because because we're executing our own strategy, right? I mean, it's not, PEP aren't coming to us and saying, this year is what we want you to do. This, this is, is our strategy. strategy. Mm. We came up with it, right? So the, mm. the alignment just right from the top goes all the way down through the organisation and mm. with a bit of recognition that you're doing things right and you're going in the right direction, you know, I'm sure that the rewards will come as, as we get into it. But I think because it's our strategy, there's, we don't really have that sort of issue of, of alignment between the parties. There's been no sort of yeah. big big blow-ups or anything like that just yet. Now, what if I told you that with just 15 minutes of effort, you could find out the top three things that are going to hold your business back from scaling in a sustainable way so that you can fulfill its potential and you can enjoy it as much as you deserve to? And what if I told you in that same 15 minutes of effort, you can find out how your business stacks up against thousands of other businesses who've taken the same test so you can actually see how you compare? If that sounds interesting, you need to head straight over to scalehq.com.au forward slash growth score. You're going to complete a short survey and you're going to get back in your inbox a free nine page report. It's going to show you how you stack up versus your peers and where you need to focus to unlock scalability and a greater level of enjoyment in your business. And for a limited time, I'm going to offer you a free 30 minute debrief on the report where myself or one of our Scale HQ founder mentors who are all experienced CEOs and have scaled successfully will unpack your specific report with you. We've done hundreds of these, and so we know exactly how to help you get the most out of the insights in there. There's no selling from us, just lots of value for you. Head over to scalehq.com.au forward slash growth score and get your free growth score report right now. You are going to love it. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm. And actually, I think that's probably one of the things that sees founders fail in taking on private equities. Actually, they haven't fully agreed the strategy before the deal gets done and then they almost yeah. end up in this, okay, it's great. Now we're invested. Let's talk about the strategy and all of a sudden the alignment goes yeah. in different directions. Yeah. And what's, and what, it, yeah. Yep. what's been the biggest challenge for you? I mean, it changes your stakeholder base. It sounds like, you know, you've got a strong private equity partner who really wants to back the leadership team, which, which frees you up a lot to be able to focus on the business. What's the biggest challenge been for you in the last 12 months having taken on a private equity owner? It, it, the the biggest challenge that we've had is actually the the pace of movement we've we've been able to achieve right it's not so much the interactions with the, the shareholders or anything mm. like that what what, mm. what we've achieved in the last 12 or 18 months would have taken us 20 years to do by ourselves right you've kind of mm. the pace of movement that's that's come and this is a vastly different organization today to what it was when i took it over as the ceo and i think trying to adapt the team and get the, the structures and the systems and all that stuff right and the new levels of governance that you need over an organisation of, of our size now, you know, we're approaching, we'll probably do 400 million or something this year, right? Like it's it's a vastly different organisation and I think trying to mature your business at that rate um, has, has been a bit of a challenge but we're starting to kind of get ourselves on top of it now. You look at risk differently and, and all this type of stuff. It's a... Uh, yeah, that there has been the thing that that occupies a lot of our time and energy. I can assure you, hundred percent outside of the odd integration or two. <laughs> well, and then I I think we sort of chatted about that in version one before we had technical difficulties. We're just starting to actually talk about M and A. Um, the businesses that you've purchased, you know, lots of people build. You know, there's lots of different strategies when you're doing a buy and build. Uh, and I'm keen to come back to actually the hundred million that you did in in organic. So let me come back to that in a second. But with the acquisitions that you've done. Some people choose to just build a house of brands and actually just focus on sort of, you know, maybe top line revenue, cross-selling, you know, perhaps as a sort of synergy opportunity. Some people want to integrate it fully, culture, systems, absolutely everything into the into the mothership, for want of a better word. Um, sounds like you've gone for a full integration uh, model, but you've still done four acquisitions in 12 months, which is a heavy amount of integration work. How is that going? How are you approaching that to make sure that it 
succeeds because of course you can destroy value very quickly um if the integration uh, is poor yeah yeah look i think when we when we i mean we've probably looked at 40 businesses in the last 12 or 18 months and bought four right and and when we look at a business there's kind of three things that we that we look for um pretty early on um and you can kind of write these down if you like number one is is chemistry it's kind of the feel between us and the management team are these guys up for what it is that we bring to them because you know a lot of these businesses are approaching ceilings that we've been near before and and part mm. of what we're trying to do is you know bring them systems to help them get through get through those ceilings right and give processes and bring our learnings of 20 years and fast forward everything for them right so so yeah. we look a lot for chemistry that's sort of number one um the number two thing we look for is uh chemistry um, and feel for the acquisition, right? So it's, you kind of get, you know, we're going, once you've got that, it's it's all this kind of alignment thing, right? So if we can get that with a management team that we can see that they are, they're up for what it is that we bring, it just makes that whole systems integration a whole lot easier. Right? <laughs> like mm. You could write a thesis called uh, chemistry and M&A and chemistry and mm. integration on the traffic logistics business that we bought in New South Wales, you know. Their mm. management team, right from the moment they met us, are just like, give us everything that you've got. We love it. We want your rostering systems, your safety systems, your finance systems. And, and if you can get that that chemistry and that alignment between the founders and the management team, it, you know, all that integration stuff just becomes a heck of a lot easier. So we look for that in in the 40 businesses, we look for the ones where we've got kind of the chemistry and are up for what we do. And of course, they need all the sustainable earnings and all that gear as well. But for me and my management team that have to go and do the integration, um, yeah, that's super important to us. So you kind of get this theme around from me about alignment and people and, and all of that really early on in the piece. And if you can get all of that right, I think you're, you're on a winning ticket. And I think we've got that in wow. spades in our business in New Zealand that we've just bought as well there. They're, they're wanting to move that. faster than us, so you know. <laughs> good problem to have. Well, Slow I love, you know, I'm I'm thrilled to hear that uh, in a business your size and with private equity owners who are, you know, really significant um, private equity players in this country, um, that they also obviously get that and they're like, yeah, oh, we agree, chemistry is important. And yeah. I actually, I'm looking forward to seeing your book, Ben, when you when you, when you finish this gig and you do <laughs> write your first book, and it's called Chemistry. <laughs> Um, I'm looking forward to reading some of the, the detail yeah. now. Can you tell me, though, can I step back about the 100 mil that you did in organic growth? Because that's staggering. How much of that was sales and marketing excellence, new product, you know, better product? Like, talk to me about the ingredients that got you that massive, um, that massive growth. Yeah, it was it was a mix of um, sales and marketing excellence for sure. Um, my my chief commercial officer is a, is a rock star, and he's been along with me through the journey up through the organisation, and sort of gave him a fair amount of ownership. And we built a really strong sales force in in and around him, so that helped open a lot of opportunities. But what actually drives growth in our business is our service, our safety, and our efficiency. So it's kind of this idea of operational excellence and the ability to supply, and you've got to remember that supply chains are tight, right? We're we're a time and materials business, right? We, you know, our biggest expense is labour. It's it's all of that, right? So we invested a lot of money in being able to, you know, get our recruitment pipelines. Like we manage recruitment in our business, like we do a sales pipeline. So if you, there's a dashboard, you pull up and you can see the recruitment pipelines all around the country. So we got our recruitment honed in bang on so we could go in and win these things and then service when our when our competitors couldn't so that 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 sort of operate and look it's still a battle we're still not all the way there but i I like to think that we've got systems and structures that allow us to do that better than anyone else so i've got a kind of cracking sales force that open the doors but the real secret source is the people in our operations and like Mm -hmm. i say some of the most incredible people right down to our guys and girls on the front line just bloody amazing right these guys make the difference and you've got that sign behind me that says get shit done it's what that's one of the values of our business right is gsd um they've just got it in spades and that there is really what helped is kind of the culture of the organization really fueled a lot of that at a mm. very difficult time for for labor you know sort of recruitment in this country we we got it right you know i love that and you know it's such a great because ex- it's not easy to scale services um because your mm. biggest risk is quality right you know if you're and yeah. you know, i remember chatting to i don't know if you've met mark uh, mealy he's a, another ypo from who built um pro uh 
Protech, Protech, Proforce. Yeah, one of the two. Yeah, Protech. Protech yeah, we know Protech. Yeah, yeah. Pro, there you go, Protech. Pro yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, for you know, similar deal, four and a half thousand people, all services. And he's like, you know, how do you engineer those recruitment processes that you just talked about to ensure that the person who rocks up every single time is bang on, knows exactly what they're doing, has all the right capabilities, delivers a great experience for that client, so that you actually get invited back. Because when you do it at scale and you're putting people out there in the field, and they are the brand and they are the service. Um, it gets you know, it gets harder. Hundred percent, and the culture amongst the frontline workers is super important. I think, and I'm kind of mm. fortunate that I've come from all the way up through it and all the rest of it, and kind of stood in their shoes and done all of that. But you know, people talk a lot about you know. I think one of the things that people don't do well with large blue collar workforces is they don't trust them, right? They they, they don't kind of and empower them and trust them. All we try and do is set this sort of framework with a couple of processes and things. And then sort of cut them loose um, to to do it the best way. And the amount of pride that my people have in what they do, it's just incredible. It's a beautiful thing to see. And I think if you can get the right leadership sort of message and empowerment for these guys, they can just deal with so much, right? Yes, they can make or break you, but my goodness, when you get it right, um, most of the work we win is because of our traffic controllers on the road. It's the, the mm. guys on the front line and the job that they do and the relationships they've got with the clients. It just makes it, you know. Um, makes it makes it pretty easy for us sometimes, you know. That I mean, that is uh, that is a really interesting challenge, and I'm 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 so impressed that that's the culture that your people are experiencing because you know there are a lot of um, large corporates that have blue collar workforces where I don't know that I've I've always found there's a level of you know I used to have um, trades training colleges and so everyone's you know brickies and painters and um, mm. and, and builders and so on and there's a healthy left level of skepticism about kind of, you know, corporate ivory towers and, you know, it's people yeah. in suits and all the rest. Um, yeah. And so when you're in a business that's north of $300 million and therefore you have layers of management and enterprise systems and all sorts of stuff, retaining that authenticity and that um, connection, I think probably it's, does it, does it get more challenging? Uh, are you finding that getting more challenging oh. as you get larger? There's no doubt that it's more challenging, but I mean, myself, my entire management team is super committed to it, though. I mean, we go out, I will go out and sit in a, sit in a donger on a work site and have a sandwich with, with traffic controllers. I'll try and do that every month. It's definitely much more challenging. And that's probably where I was saying at the start, you know, the idea of how you communicate, you've got to just continually evolve that. You've got to continually try and get better and change that because there's no doubt with four and a half thousand of them i mean when i took the gig we had 1600 mm. right it's it's a mm. vastly different organization but the the culture of the organization is to be super committed to it and it's sort of real visible frontline leadership is something we really push amongst our management teams and that's that's got to be led by by me as the dude at the top you've got to take the time to to get out there amongst it with the the real people who and they're the best days i have in the gig absolute best days yeah. I have in the gig. Yeah. And I bet you've yeah. got, I mean, you must have a significant amount of um, personal brand equity given you come from the front line in that organization, in that industry, your entire career. And you're clearly a very personable guy, so probably very approachable um, mm. for the team. What, if you think about the next five years, uh, <laughs> might even be quite daunting, but you're already at 350 million, you're acquiring a whole bunch of uh, other businesses and, you know, you may have looked at 40 and you've got four, but as you, you know, as you will have uh, been experiencing, no doubt, it's not like there's just an infinite number of businesses that make sense for mm -hmm. you to acquire. So it's not like, you know, it's uh, uh, necessarily a gigantic cottage industry where you want to you know, get all these tiny little players. How are you thinking about the growth strategy for the next five years? How are you going to keep up those sort of those rates of growth, but in sensible, you know, acquisitions and sensible organic growth that makes sense for your strategy? Yeah, look, it, it it actually is a, a quite a cottage industry with a lot of small players, and there's more than a thousand traffic management companies in Australia, or something like that. But that's not really our pathway to growth. That's not really what we're focused but, on. Yeah. What we're trying to do now is is build scale in key markets because where what we're all about is kind of trying to redefine the way this industry operates. We search the world to try and find the right sort of IoT digital twinning technology to bring to this industry and really kind of charge it into 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 the new sort of century and we've got that now and this and PEP have been very good I mean that's part of the reason why we went out is to get the funding and make all that happen but you know we're kind of at the point where that product is ready to be released out to the market and this here is really 
what we're getting after over the next couple of years. We've right, kind of got okay. scale in our key markets, and this year is going to be the sort of key driver for us over the next couple of years and, and really the legacy that we want to leave behind. Um, when, when we're all said and done here, we want to, we want to leave behind a, yeah, a real change to the safety of road workers in, in our region, you know. And is that technology that you sort of researched and then developed yourselves or have you sort of licensed things in or have you acquired other companies that have got the capability yeah, like yeah. how have you how you bring together such a rapid technology um, change in the business in terms of what you yeah, we, we we learned our lesson about building it ourselves we won't be doing that again so um no this this product exists in our industry uh, across europe and and uh canada so mm -hmm. we were able to, to work with the guys who built and developed it to adapt it to the Australian market and then do an exclusive sort of licensing deal with those guys for, for a long mm -hmm. period. So mm -hmm. we, we searched for the technology. It was hard. You know, despite um, urgings of a couple of my management teams, I was never going to build it. Um, so, yeah, we, we've licensed in professionals. We just buy the product off them and roll it out and pay them their fee. I like it. Wow, it's really interesting uh, times ahead for you. Can I ask you, Ben, to, I know we started looking at the future, but actually just to think back in the past, if you kind of reflect on the principles that you have applied as a leader, like, you know, sometimes there's pieces of, of advice that you don't realize how influential they are until you're on the other side of having implemented those, those and you kind of look back and go, actually, that was really critical in our ability to get to where we are today whether it's on the people side or whether it's on the sort of commercial side of the business and how you've generated the revenue what are some of when you sort of think back what are some of the principles some of the lessons or some of the pieces of advice that have really stuck with you that you think have made a huge difference in your ability to scale the way you have yeah i think you know i i think what we one of the things that's really helped us is just trying to simplify a lot of stuff that that goes on in the joint but i think probably the the main bit that i didn't quite realize that i did for almost my entire career until just recently is you know kind of this focus on people and growing people right and trying to get that driven down into the organization you know i mean people you know again you mentioned it before i resonate a lot with our workforce because of where i come from but our entire organization is almost built in house right they're, they're people that we've have found themselves in this industry for one reason or another and this real focus on growing and improving people and helping them achieve their full potential that i didn't quite realize at the time i was pushing into the business but now realize it's absolutely all through it this here is the thing that's changed it. This is what has created this this culture of, of sort of winning and always doing better and never being satisfied and all of this type of stuff. We've we've been able to build that and we've been able to build that through authenticity. Like it the way that I speak to you now is the way that we speak inside of the organization all day, every day. It's you know, it's, it's very open, lots of banter, there's no egos, all of that type of stuff. We've just been able to build this really beautiful thing. Um just by focusing on the success of trying to liberate, you know, sort of human ability inside of the joint. And um, it's just, it's a, it's bloody amazing. And I think if we can keep doing that, um, you know, the earnings growth and all the rest of it, that's all just a byproduct of, of some of the most incredible people you'll ever clamp eyes on, I'm telling you. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. What has been the most, you know, as a CEO, you go through some hard stuff, as you said, when you stepped up into that role, well, you know, you'd kind of underestimated how difficult it was going to be and what it would actually include. What has been personally for you the hardest thing about this, um, the leadership journey for you? Uh, it, it's It's been more on the personal front. It's been the, the, the toll of how much energy. I totally underestimated the energy and effort that, that is involved in, in doing this at this scale and the, the hours and the travel and the time that you're away and all the rest of it. I mean, you have some pretty... Uh, people listening to you now would know you have some pretty lonely nights sitting in, in hotel rooms and, and on, you know, when I get to the end of doing this, if I never see the inside of an aircraft ever again, I'll be a happy man. Um, but I think for me, that's probably been the biggest challenge is just trying to really get that balance right between home. I've got three young children, um, what are they, five, six and nine, you know, three young children, beautiful wife, and just trying to get that balance right and be, be a present dad because that there is actually the most important job that I've got. Um, mm. with, with everything else that's going on in the world. That's been the challenge, just trying to get that right with all the activity over the last year or so. Can you talk about any, you know, um, what's a good example of something that you've actually implemented 
that is helping you get that balance right because you know having spent you know 60 percent of my career over the course of six or seven years on a plane mm-hmm. I, I only i know only too well with similar age kids during that period mm-hmm. um the the impact that it can have on the family what are some of the things that you are doing that are actually making a difference in helping you finding the balance i'm not sure that there's a like balance right there's no necessarily there's yeah. no like equilibrium you ever get to but what are you putting yeah. in place that's helping you? Yeah, yeah. Generally, I never travel on a weekend, so never a Friday night, never a Sunday. I try and always Mondays and Tuesdays. I try and avoid travel as much as possible. I want to drop the kids off at school and I want to pick them up in the afternoon. So I try and do that sort of every Monday and Tuesday. And then yeah, we've we've got a pretty good routine of of getting away as a family uh, on weekends. We've got a, a place that we can go to and sort of connect up there. Um, which mm-hmm. is probably the worst financial investment I ever made. You spend most of it. It's <laughs> flooded three times and all the rest of it. But uh, on the personal front, what it means for us as a family, that, that's that been huge. And just being disciplined around um, getting there and being present is uh, pretty important to us, you know. And I've uh, massively enjoyed this um, conversation and I wish I could uh, extend it even further. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you really wish that I would have asked you so far in this conversation that you'd like to share with the audience? Um. No, look, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's been a, a good, good story. So, I, what I would just impress upon your your audience, when, it, when if you're ever in a position where you've got a large um, sort of uh, frontline workforce, services based business, if you're ever there, well, all I would impress upon them is just to really understand how amazing these people can be, and to to trust them and be authentic with them, be open. I mean, that there has really been what has gotten me to where I am and is what is driving our business through to the next level. Um, you know, that that there would be probably the main message I would leave with anyone. Just, you know, trust them, right? Trust them. Give them a, a, an opportunity to achieve their full potential and you'll just be astounded at, at what they can do, you know, so. I love that. That's a beautiful principle. Thank you so much, uh, Ben Marston, and I'd, I'd really uh, appreciate your wisdom uh, today and thank you so much on behalf of our audience. If people wanted to get in touch uh, with you or with your team or follow along with the uh, the Altus journey, what, where would you direct them to? Uh, just hit us up on LinkedIn. Stick to us there. There's, there's plenty of activity there. There's stuff on social media all over the place. So feel free to connect up there and uh, happy to catch up and have a chat with anyone who's uh, who wants to hear me yabber on a bit and tell a story or two. So. <laughs> beautiful. Ben Marsnet, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your time. And thank you very much to our beautiful audience. If there's one thing that you could do, Uh, for us today is actually get Ben's wisdom out of the world is actually just click the share link on whatever podcast player you're using, send this to somebody who you know is going to love and get some good inspiration and some great um, tips from Ben on how to grow their business. Uh, We really appreciate it. And we will see you again next week. Thanks again, Ben, so much. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure. The team here at Scale HQ hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Now, if you want to achieve scale, but you want to know what's going to hold you back, we can help. Head over to scalehq.com.au forward slash growth score to get your free nine page growth score report. That's going to help you understand where your top three barriers are to scale. And if you'd like, we'll even do a free debrief on the report for you with no obligations or expectations, just lots of value from some CEOs who've scaled to help you on your journey. That's scalehq.com.au forward slash growth score and find out what's holding you back from fulfilling the potential of your business today.